Okay, I guess we can start. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Adam Warski. Uh, thank you all for coming. It's great to be here. Uh, back at DevOps, uh, actually one of my first conference talks was on DevOps as well, but that was nine years ago, so quite a lot of time. Um, so yeah, so today I'd like to talk about how uh, can you use Kafka as a, as a message queue. Uh, but before the how, uh, I would also like to discuss uh, should you do it at all, right? Maybe it's not such a good idea, um, or maybe it is. Um, so the rough plan uh, for the next 50 minutes or so is first we will make a, an overview of how acknowledgments work in plain Kafka, so what you get out of the box. Uh, then we will uh, wonder for a bit why would you want a different model for, of acknowledgments that is selective acknowledgments. And we'll look at some alternatives. Kafka is certainly not alone here. There are, other, there are other message queue implementations which you might also want to use. Finally, we'll, you, uh, we'll look at the implementation of the message queue on top of Kafka, which is called KMQ. Uh, there will be a short demo, so hopefully that will work. And uh, we'll also talk about performance, which is uh, quite important in systems, uh, in big data systems like, like Kafka. So if you would have any questions, if I would like, if I would uh, skip over some important Kafka detail that you don't understand, please ask a, a question. Uh, I'll try to answer. Um, okay. Um, and yeah, and before we start, also to give you some context on who, who's actually talking to you. So I'm a software engineer and co-founder of Software Mill. Uh, that's a, a software consultancy and a custom software, dev a custom software development house in Poland. Um, so we do quite a lot of software, mainly using Scala and, and Java, uh, also quite often using Kafka, and that's why I'm talking about Kafka, well, one of the reasons. I'm also doing some open source, uh, so I once did a lot of Java, so if you're using Hibernate, uh, maybe you've seen Hibernate Anniverse, so I've been involved in that. Now I'm uh, doing more Scala things like HTTP, QuickLens, MacOI, and so on. I have a blog and Twitter, so that's nothing very original. Um, okay, so let's, uh, let's take a look at how acknowledgments work in plain Kafka, okay? So the central topic in Kafka is a topic. That's where you put your messages, your data. Right? That's like a, lo a logical unit where uh, your data is written to. Okay? So when you create a topic, you specify how many partitions should a topic have. Okay? Uh, these partitions can be placed on different servers, and it's up to Kafka to balance which partitions go to which servers for, re for rep uh, replication, uh, f fault tolerance, and so on. So you create the topic with a number of, of partitions. Now when you write data to a topic, each message that you write to a topic goes to a single partition. Okay? Which partition that is, is decided by uh, one of many algorithms. So it can be random, it can be based on some property, and so on. So, that's when, so when you write a message to a topic, it goes to a single partition. Uh, now at some point we usually also want to read data from a topic, right? So then we create a consumer, or usually you create a number of consumers. So these consumers uh, form a consumer group. And um, we create an, a number of consumers for two reasons. Uh, one is performance, so we want to process messages in parallel, and the other is false tolerance. So if a consumer dies, another one takes over. So in a single consumer group, there are many consumers, but Kafka assigns to each consumer a set of partitions which will be handled by that consumer. Right? So each, uh, each consumer gets a set of partitions, and all consumers in the, partition, in, in the consumer group uh, get all the partitions like in total. So the partitions are divided among the, in the consumers. So now, uh, let's say uh, we have a topic with three, with three partitions, and we have a consumer. Uh, this, uh, this consumer got uh, assigned uh, partition number two. There may be more, but let's say it only got assigned one. And it's reading data from the, from the topic, right? So we're reading some data processing, so we are executing some business logic uh, to handle each of, this, uh, of, these, me of these messages. Uh, and now, uh, we usually would like to have some mechanism to save our progress. Right? When the consumer restarts, or when it dies and is uh, taken over by some other node, or when the cluster is re rebalanced, we usually don't want to reprocess everything from the beginning. Right? We want to actually uh, start processing where we last uh, uh, stopped. Right? So we need a way to save our progress. Um, 
So Kafka offers such a mechanism. It's called uh, the offset storage. Um, so uh, we have the possibility to write to Kafka the offset. So like the position in the in the Kafka in the, in, in the Kafka topic, uh, we can write the offset up to which we have processed all messages. Okay, so using this, we can uh, implement at least once or at most once processing. So if we read a message, uh, save the offset, and then execute the business logic, that will gives us at most once processing, right? Because the offset is always written before processing the message. So even if uh, something happens, uh, if the if the consumer is restarted, it will uh, start reading after this saved off uh, this saved offset. If we want to have at, uh, uh, at least once processing, then we have to commit the offset after the message is processed. Right? So we process the message. Once we know that the message is successfully processed, we store the offset. Okay? The important thing here is that storing an offset acknowledges all the messages up to that offset. Yes? Do you have a question? Or do you just waving to a friend? Okay. That's fine. But if you would have a question, I'm, you know, I'm here. Um, so yeah, uh, so the important thing here is that we uh, acknowledge the processing of all messages up to the given offset. Okay? We can't say that we want to only acknowledge a given batch of, of, uh, of uh, messages. These are all messages up to that offset. So that's, that's what you get out of the box when using, when using Kafka. OK, so why would we want a different model of acknowledgments, selective acknowledgments? So let's say that uh, as part of executing the business logic of uh, when, when you handle the message, you want, for example, to call an HTTP endpoint, right? So for each message, uh, this message translates somehow to an HTTP call, right? Or maybe you want to send an email, or maybe you want, uh, like in general, uh, integrate with any other external system. Right? So I guess that's quite a common scenario. So here, the up to, up to an offset um, commit mechanism isn't that useful, because all of these calls may fail individually. Right? It's quite common that an HTTP call fails, uh, either because of client error, server error, uh, maybe some business logic error. Right? So these things happen, but we don't want an individual uh, error uh, in handling a single message to stop the whole system, right? Maybe you want that single call to be retried. So uh, maybe we have uh, called an HTTP endpoint and it was unavailable at that time, so we want to retry it in like, say, 10 minutes or something like that, right? Um, but that shouldn't stop us from, uh, from, pro from, pro from processing the other messages that are further down in the topic, okay? So here, the uh, committing all offsets up to, up to a given point isn't really that useful uh, because, well, uh, we, uh, if a single message fails, right, we don't want to retry uh, after a period of time, we don't want to retry all messages that have been in, in, in uh, that batch, right? Because that would lead to the, uh, a lot of uh, duplicate messages uh, being processed. And we also don't want to stop processing because that would delay processing of subsequent messages. So that's why we would actually want to have a way of acknowledging only a single message or a batch of messages, but not all messages up to a given offset. So what I've described here is, in fact, uh, the user, uh, usage scenario uh, for, a, for a message queue, right? Uh, there's quite a lot of message queue implementations out there. There's RabbitMQ, ActiveMQ, Artemis, which is like a newer ActiveMQ, SQS, and so on. Um, so that's nothing new. And uh, if you have that available in your system, uh, you can simply solve the problem that I've been describing using this, these systems. So why would we even consider using Kafka instead of a message queue? Right? Well, I think there are three, re three main reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, quite often nowadays when we uh, have a system and we accept some data into the system, we want to be sure that once we uh, say whoever wrote that data to our system, we say that uh, the data is written, that the data is actually replicated across a cluster and safely stored. Uh, so Kafka offers us a proven and reliable uh, clustering and replication mechanisms, which have been tried in a lot of deployments. Uh, and I think it's something you can trust. 
right? Uh, you can uh, quite, with a, a quite high degree of confidence, trust that Kafka won't lose your data. Um, secondly, uh, Kafka is well known for its performance. Uh, so if we could uh, build a system, a, a message queuing system on top of Kafka, which uh, could at least partially have uh, uh, the performance of the plain Kafka, that would be quite, quite nice. Finally, there's the convenience of operational complexity, right? If we already have Kafka in our system, then adding, for example, a RabbitMQ cluster, an ActiveMQ cluster, that significantly increases the operational complexity of the whole system, right? So maybe if we can actually implement the functionality that we need without sacrificing, of course, functionality, then this, uh, that, was, uh, that, that would actually make our whole system simpler, right? So if you already have Kafka, maybe you can use it for that functionality as well. Um, so I would like to explore Amazon SQS in a bit more detail because we will actually build something similar on top of Kafka. So Amazon SQS is a message queuing as a service. I suppose many of you have come across it. And it has a very simple API. Right? It works in the Amazon Cloud, so you, you just use it. You don't, you don't have to install anything. Um, there are four basic comments. So there's a create queue, which uh, not very surprisingly creates a queue. Send message, receive message, and delete message. Right? Send message, again, is probably so, quite self-explanatory. So now, when we receive a message from SQS, what happens is that the message is not deleted, but it's put aside for uh, a given period of time. That period of time is called the visibility timeout. Okay? So now if we don't delete the message within the visibility timeout, it will be put back into the queue. Right? If, when the message is put back into the queue, subsequent receive calls will actually see the message and it will be received again. Okay? And using this mechanism, we can implement, uh, again, at least once delivery of uh, messages. So. Um, so when we receive a message, right, we execute some business logic for it. Once the logic is done, we delete the message and everything's fine. If the business logic falls over for some reason, I know the, the node dies or whatever, uh, then after the, the visibility timeout passes, the message will be again available for receiving by a receive message call. Okay, so that's Amazon XQS, and it quite often works great. Uh, however, there's, of course, a couple of problems with it. Uh, so uh, if you really have a lot of messages to process, it can become quite expensive at, at a large scale. Um, second is also it, uh, it has good performance, uh, but the latency is not, is not always that great. Uh, latency in terms of the time between sending and receiving uh, a message. Okay, so how, how could we implement um, a message queue on top of Kafka? Okay, so <clears throat> we will uh, use two topics, two, uh, two uh, Kafka topics. Uh, we'll have the queue topic, which uh, will contain uh, most of our data. So that, that's where we actually write the messages. That's, that's where we, we store the data to process. And we will also have a markers topic. Um, where the markers topic will store for each message a start and marker. How this works, I will explain in a second. So now it's important that both of these topics have the same number of partitions. Okay? So each uh, partition in the queue topic will have a corresponding partition in the markers topic. Okay? There's a one-to-one -one correspondence. So that's the setup um, on the Kafka side. Um, now we will also have a number of queue clients. So uh, the queue clients is where the data is actually processed. Okay? Um, so there will be typically a lot of them. Well, maybe not a lot, but a couple of them. Again, for performance and for failover. Uh, so that's where the business logic is executed. But because you want to have these selective acknowledgments, it will be a bit more complicated than the regular Kafka consumer. Um, and finally, we have uh, a number of re-delivery re re tracker components, which will actually handle uh, which will monitor if a message should be re-delivered re uh, or not. Um, okay, so how, the, how does the queue client work? Um, so the first thing it does, it reads a message uh, from, from the queue topic. Uh, once we have read a message, we write a, a start marker into the markers topic, and the start marker contains the offset of the read message, so the position of the message in the, in the, in the queue topic. Okay. 
And now what's important is that we wait for that send call to complete. So now here I'm, uh, an important uh, note is that here I'm describing the flow for a single message, uh, but we can actually do it in batches to increase performance. So if we have waited uh, for the send to complete for each individual message, that would actually be quite slow. But if we batch things together, it's, uh, it's uh, much better. Okay, so we, we read the message, uh, we write the start marker, um, then we commit the offset uh, of, uh, so now, now we use the Kafka uh, mechanism of the offset committing. So we commit the, the offset of, uh, to Q, so that when our consumer restarts, it will actually start uh, reading uh, from the right place and not reprocess too many messages. We can do that because the start marker has, al has already been written, so it, it's like in the KMQ system. So then we can finally, in step four, uh, process the message. So we execute the business logic associated with the message. And when that's successfully done, we write the end marker to the markers topic again. So the end marker again contains um, the position, so the, the message offset, so the position of the message in the, in the queue topic. Okay, so uh, showing this a bit more graphically. So let's say we have our topic with... Uh, three partitions, right? The queue topic, and on the right uh, we have the markers topic, uh, also with three partitions. So uh, each partition in the queue topic has a corresponding partition in the markers topic. Okay. So uh, what we do here is first we read um, we read some messages from the topic. So let's say we have a client, a, a consumer, which again uh, reads messages from the second partition. Um, so we read some messages from, 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 from the topic, and the first thing we do is for each red message, we write a start marker, right? Now, once we are certain that the start marker has been written, we can actually commit, uh, commit the offset, uh, the red offset, um, back to Kafka. Um, and now, uh, once the marker has been uh, written and the offset's committed, we can uh, process the message. So processing the message can end in two ways. So it can either fail for whatever reason, and if it fails, well, we can't really do anything, right? Because the node might be non non-existent anymore, so we don't do anything, right? Or it may succeed. Uh, if the business logic succeeds, uh, then we write the end marker uh, for that uh, for, for that message into the markers topic, okay? So now that's, uh, these five steps are what's implemented in the queue client uh, component. Now I mentioned there's already, uh, there's also another component called the red delivery tracker. Now the red delivery tracker streams all those markers and it keeps an in-memory priority queue um, of all the messages for which there has been a start marker but hasn't been an end marker. Okay, um, so now uh, ad additionally there's a trigger which fires every second or so and it checks if there are any messages uh, for which there has been a start marker and there hasn't been an end marker for, a co for the visibility timeout uh, period. So let's say uh, maybe uh, in our case it can be 30 seconds, right? So if there hasn't been an end marker for 30 seconds, then we should probably re-deliver the message. So to re-deliver the message, what the re-delivery tracker has to do is it looks for that particular offset in the queue topic and uh, reads the message and writes it back again to the topic. Okay? So in fact, the message isn't uh, re-delivered uh, per se, but uh, a copy of it is being written into the, uh, into the topic, so it will be reprocessed. Okay? Um, so, yeah, so as I said, the redelivery tracker, it's a Kafka application, uh, meaning that it uses standard Kafka consumer pro 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 producer APIs. There's not really a lot of magic there. It's a consumer of the markers topic. Um, there should be multiple instances of the redelivery tracker for failover. Uh, if one of them dies, the other, the other will take, take over. Um, if you have multiple instances and you have a, uh, so they, all the redelivery trackers um, uh, form a consumer group, um, so if you attach, uh, if, if you attach the red delivery tracker to the markers topic, they will actually uh, divide the partitions to consume between themselves using Kafka's auto partition assignment. Um, as I said, the red delivery tracker holds an in-memory priority queue. Now this may sound uh, dangerous if there's a lot of messages, 
But if you think about it, like the most messages that there will ever be in the uh, in the priority queue is as much as uh, uh, as the visibility timeout, right? So if the visibility timeout is uh, 30 seconds, right? We won't hold more than 30 seconds of message offsets, really, not not uh, not messages, but but only offsets, right? Um, so even if you have a, a a uh, lot of messages, 30 seconds of uh, messages probably will fit in your memory without any problems. Um, and another question uh, about the red delivery tracker is, isn't the red delivery actually very slow? Because we have, when we see that a message should be re-delivered, right, we have to do a seek in the queue topic and then uh, read that message and write it back again. Okay? Uh, so it sounds bad, but it's actually not that bad. And the good thing here is uh, that uh, we only do the seeks in the redelivery re tracker going forward in the in the queue topic, right? So if the messages aren't processed, uh, if there are no end, end markers for the messages, uh, then they will always be uh, timing out in order of their offsets, right? So uh, so like the consumer. The redeliver consumer in the tracker of the queue topic always goes forward, so it's like delayed by the visibility uh, by the visibility timeout. So it's delayed by 30 seconds or so, but it will always go forward with the flow. So it's actually not not that bad. Uh, there, there won't be uh, that much actual seeks, so 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 the disk sh should should be fine. Okay, so now let's see uh, how this works. In practice, and if this works in practice, yeah. Um, how do you guarantee that the redelivery tracker doesn't deliver the same message more than once? Okay, how do I guarantee that the redelivery tracker doesn't redeliver the same message more than once? Okay, so if it crashes, then I don't. Uh, so if if everything works fine, uh, then once the, re the re re once the redelivery happens, an end marker is written for this old message, so the redelivery tracker, even upon restart, uh, won't try to redeliver again. But if it crashes in the middle of redelivery, then the message will be redelivered twice. But uh, so yeah, so all that I'm describing here is actually at least once uh, delivery anyway, right? Because um, even like if the message, uh, if the message is processed successfully from the queue, right? Uh, the node may crash just before ri ri writing the end marker, for example. So then you get duplicate and delivery anyway. So you have to be prepared for that. So our goal is to minimize, of course, the, uh, the uh, duplicates, but we can't prevent them entirely. Okay, so uh, let me first start a Kafka cluster. So it's Kafka 1.0. So first what we have to do is we have to start Zookeeper. Once Zookeeper is up, uh, we will start Kafka itself, and we will uh, have to create two topics. Okay, starting server, and yeah, okay. I guess binding to port is as good uh, as it gets. Uh, so now we start the the Kafka server. So that's like your typical uh, Kafka startup. Okay, Zookeeper here is fine. Kafka, <coughs> I guess as well. Okay. Ah, yeah. Now, now it's now it's started. The startup complete. Okay, that's good. So now we create uh, the topics. So we have to create two topics, right? So uh, first of all, we'll create the two, uh, the queue topic. So here it is. Uh, it's very unimaginatively called queue. But it can be any name, of course. And in our uh, example, maybe I will make this bigger. Mm, sorry. Still quite small. Yeah, maybe it's better now. OK, so, uh, so yeah, so we create the queue topic. It will have five partitions and a replication factor of one, because I have only one laptop here. So yeah, let's create the queue topic. Um, then we will have to create the second topic, holding the markers, and this will again be called quite unimaginatively uh, the markers topic. Why is it taking so long? 
Okay, created the topic Q. Now we create the topic markers. Mm. I guess my computer is telling me it's time for an upgrade. Okay. And then when we list the topics, we actually should see that we have the two topics created. Okay, so and that's that's the setup on the Kafka side. We have uh, we have our two two topics created. So yeah, well, it will finish eventually. Um, okay, so now let's let's see the code for the actual um, um, uh, KMQ usage. Okay, I guess that's big enough. Um, so first of all. Uh, we have the configuration. Uh, so it's an open source project. It's, uh, you can take a look at it if, you, if you'd like to. It's all relatively simple code. Uh, so uh, uh, to actually make it work, it requires uh, two configuration classes. Uh, one is the KMQ config. So the KMQ config class holds the name of the topic uh, that we are going to use for the queue, the name of the topic that we are going to use for the markers data. Right, so these are the two names. The, the, they need to correspond to whatever we have just created in Kafka, and uh, also here we have the duration of the visibility timeout. So after how long uh, will the system try to read all of our messages? So uh, 90 seconds is probably too much. So let's make it, uh, or maybe even 10 seconds, so that we don't have to wait too much. Actually, 10 will be too fast. Let's make it 15. Okay. Uh, and another one is uh, Kafka clients. That's just a helper class to create Kafka consumers and producers using uh, the given Kafka host. Um, but the important thing here is that we have the name of the queue topic, the name of the markers topic, and the visibility timeout. Okay. So now let's look uh, at the client uh, standalone processor. Okay. So here we are. Uh, so uh, here we are going to use uh, the KMQ client class. So that's that's the important part. The KMQ client class uh, we need to pass it the the configuration. And if we go and take a look at the Im implementation over here, you can see that the the the, the numbers here uh, correspond uh, to the steps that I have described in the diagram earlier, right? So what the Q client does. It has a method called next batch, so this reads the next batch of messages from Kafka. So what it does is uh, first we get messages from our queue topic, right? So here we are using uh, I'm not sure how familiar you are with Kafka's API, but that's like regular Kafka consumer API, right? That's what you get get out of the box from Kafka. So we get a batch of messages. Then, as I said, for each message. Uh, that we have got, that we got, we write the start marker. Um, so here again, we are using a plain Kafka API to actually send uh, the start marker to the markers topic, right? Uh, we do it in a batch, and then after all the markers for the batch are uh, written, we actually wait for the sends to complete, right? As I said, we are doing that in batches, so that is much faster. Um, okay, now that all the batches are actually sent, uh, we uh, commit the offsets and return the records to the consumer. Okay, so uh, uh, at that point, step number four would be executing the business logic, right? So now, yeah, we have the step number four somewhere on the client side. We'll see that in a second. And when the client is done processing a message, for each message, the client should call the processed method. So the process method will actually write the end marker. And what is important here is that uh, the acknowledgement of each message can be done out of order, uh, asynchronously, so in any thread. So it doesn't have to follow the, the order in which the messages have been returned to, to the client. right? So it's totally uh, it's uh, total up to you in what order and when do we actually acknowledge the processing of a message. Right, so the KMQ client implements these four steps that I have mentioned. Again, here the fifth step, sending the end marker, it's using regular Kafka producer APIs. Um, and and then here's the usage of the client. So here's the client, right? So what we do is we read 
the next batch of messages from the client. The next batch uh, will actually uh, send the start markers, right? And now we execute our, our business logic. So here is just a demo business logic. Uh, what it does is it uses an executor to process each message in parallel. Um, so we have a process message method here, which will at random return true or false. If it returns true, then the message is processed. Uh, and we actually call the fifth step, so writing the end marker. And if the, is, and if the return value is false, it will drop the message. So we simulate failure, right? So we will have some messages will be dropped. So if you look at the processed method, uh, process message method, you can see that it uh, uh, roughly one in 10, uh, so 10% 10 of uh, messages should be dropped, right? And the other, there's some logging just to see that we actually uh, process the messages and how many we have processed so far. Um, so yeah, so one in 10 messages should, sh should be dropped. And of course, after the 15 seconds passes, they should be redelivered. Okay, so that's, that's our client logic here. Uh, now we also need two other things. So we need a way to actually send messages to the topic. So that's a very uh, simple class. Um, it's a bit of a, it's a uh, it's a bit of code, but all it does really is it creates a Kafka producer over here. So that's like a completely ordinary Kafka producer of uh, messages where the key is a byte buffer and the value is a byte buffer. It doesn't matter. It's you know just an example. So that's a Kafka producer, and what we do is we send a hundred of messages to our topic, and uh, here it is, right? And so it's just sending messages so that we can see that something is happening. And th this has like uh, no code coming from KMQ. It's just pure, pure, pure Kafka for the demo. So we have uh, we have a way to send message. We have a way to process messages. But I also also mentioned that we actually need a way to track the redeliveries. Okay. And for that we have a third class, which is the redelivery tracker, which will actually consume the markers topic. And if a message is not acknowledged, it will redeliver it. Uh, so here it's uh, again very simple. Uh, that's coming from KMQ. There's actually a redelivery re re tracker class which has a start method, and all we need to do is call it, passing in the Kafka. At the Kafka clients, what the redelivery tracker does is, as I said, it maintains the in-memory queue. Okay, so let's start this. So let's start um, the redelivery tracker first. Um, yes, yeah, so it starts up. Why are there are errors? Leader not available. Of course. Uh, number of alive brokers is zero. Does not meet the required replication factor of one. Why there are no alive brokers? That should not happen. And there are some Kav Zookeeper exceptions. Well, <clears throat> the only reasonable thing that we can do right now is restart everything. Uh, okay, let's try running Zookeeper again. Uh, I'm not sure why. Well, it worked like an, an hour ago, so. And let me remove old Kafka data. OK. So yeah, so the Zookeeper works. Huh. And Kafka doesn't want to shut down even. Maybe I have too much, maybe I have something running in the background. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, I'll make it work just after. It will start working just after the session uh, completes. Uh, so it's a pity it doesn't work though. Let me try killing all of that. Why doesn't it want to close? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's something hanging in the background. Uh, nine kill minus nine. That usually does it. Yeah. Okay. So now let's try Zookeeper again. 
Um, so yeah, so I, what I wanted to do is uh, I wanted to start two read delivery trackers, so they would actually divide the partitions which they consume between them, themselves. And then we would see that when we run the processor and when we, so we then can run the sender, which actually populates the topic with some data. And when we run the processor, uh, it would consume uh, the data quite fast, dropping about 10% of, of the messages. Uh, then after 15 seconds, uh, the remaining on average 10 messages would be, re would be re delivered. So again, here we would drop on average one message, and then this man one message would be redirected again. Okay, so let's try running Kafka again. Um, but I created the topics before that, and it worked. So it must have stopped working somewhere between creating the topics and actually running the, the code. Well, that's weird. Uh, Startup complete, okay. So let's create the queue topic. <coughs> Sorry for that. One thing that is suspicious is that it takes a long time. Topic queue already exists. Okay, well, I won't be spending it too much time actually trying to make this work, uh, but I guess you you, uh, you get the idea of how this could work if it worked fine. Um, so yeah, so now about the performance of, uh, of how this actually works. Uh, so we did some tests uh, on a three-node Kafka cluster uh, using reasonably large Amazon servers. So we used a servers with uh, M8 CPUs and 32 gigabytes of RAM. So nothing very fancy, but non not the smallest instance as well. Um, we are running the test in a single availability zone using 100 byte messages. They were sent in batches of up to 10 messages. And we, were qu we used quite strict replication settings. So we wanted to be sure that once uh, a send message completes, uh, the, that the message is, is replicated. So we used a replication factor of three for the, for the topic. And Kafka was configured uh, with a minimum in sync replicas of two. So if uh, uh, the majority of nodes has to be up for, for, the, for everything to work. And um, when sending a message, we require an acknowledgement from the majority of nodes. Um, OK, and yeah, we were sending, so there was the MQ in the middle, either plain Kafka or uh, play the uh, Kafka with, with acknowledgements. Um, and, we were, and we had a, a number of sender and receiver nodes trying to um, to send and receive messages. Um, and what we found out is that in an online scenario, so when you are sending and receiving messages at the same time, uh, performance is quite comparable. Uh, so one, one thing to keep in mind when lo looking at these graphs is that these are not uh, like numbers, uh, absolute numbers, which you can actually say that Kafka can process up to 60, 60k messages per second. These are only that's only the performance of Kafka in that specific setup, right? It's not like high-end servers or anything like that, and it's also uh, very specific in terms of uh, the replication settings and so on. So it's only for comparison between plain Kafka and Kafka with selective acknowledgments. Okay, so in uh, plain Kafka, we uh, we got 60,000 messages per second. At most, in KMQ, a, a bit less, but nothing very significant. Okay, so why is that? Like KMQ actually does quite a lot of additional work, right? We send the marker stop, we send the start marker, and then we wait until it's being sent, and then we send the end marker, and so on. Um, so I think the explanation here is that the operation that actually saturates the cluster is uh, sending a message using uh, the replication settings. So it's actually after when each message is sent, uh, we need to wait for confirmation from the majority of nodes. And that's what saturates the cluster, not the process of not, uh, so it's the sending side, not the receiving side, which actually processes the message with either batch or selective acknowledgements. And uh, if you actually run, uh, we, we also run a test where uh, we started a, a plain Kafka consumer on a topic which contained messages. So it's not an online scenario, but it's a scenario where there's 
a given number of messages waiting in the topic. So uh, when we comp when you uh, uh, when we run plain Kafka uh, versus KMQ, KMQ is actually uh, two times s slower than plain Kafka. Okay, in this scenario where the topic al already contained messages, uh, and that's uh, what you would expect, kind of, because uh, KMQ kind of has to do twice the work uh, because of the markers. Uh, what's also important is the latency. So in our setup uh, with plain Kafka, we have seen consistent latency. It's, here's the 95th percentile uh, of 50 milliseconds. So the latency between sending a message and receiving a message. So with KMQ, it usually, is, it usually was 50 milliseconds as well. However, when we got to the, uh, I think our highest was using Oh, there's no nodes here. I think the highest was using eight sender and, and the receiver nodes. This goes up to 130 milliseconds. Again, uh, again, that's something you would expect because uh, KMQ has the added latency of um, sending the start markers and markers, right? For which, uh, so we d we don't actually have to wait for the end markers for the sends to complete. We have to wait for the start marker sends to complete, right? So you kind of expect that the latency would be two times as bad in the extreme scenario. Uh, so KMQ, in summary, doesn't really impact throughput, it impacts latency. Um, another interesting test is what if messages are dropped. So here we have, uh, again, it's an online uh, scenario test. So we have been dropping 50% of messages consistently. Uh, so in the beginning, you can see that it's a fairly stable uh, throughput rate, uh, right? But uh, uh, because there are still messages, new 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 messages being sent and messages being produced, uh, received, and so on. But when the send process completes, so when all the test messages are sent, uh, then you can see an exponential uh, uh, declining curve, which means uh, because we are dropping 50% of uh, messages, so uh, First, 50% of messages have been dropped, right? Then they are retried. So on the next retry, 25% uh, of these will be dropped, and so on and so on, right? That's why you get the the, the, the declining exponential curve. So that's uh, like, like this graph con confirms what you would expect um, from this throughput graph uh, when 50% of the messages are actually dropped. Um, Okay. As for the internals uh, of how uh, of how the KMQ is written, uh, again, as I said, it's quite simple code. It's it's uh, not a lot of code. I guess it's quite easy to actually read it um, reasonably fast and understand it. It's implemented in Scala. However, all the APIs are using Java. So as I've shown you, we have been using plain Java. Uh, it uses uh, the redelivery tracker uses Akka under the hood. So there's one actor per the markers topic partition and one actor per Q topic partition. So uh, if the re if the redelivery tracker is assigned multiple uh, marker um, partitions, they all handled concurrently. The redeliveries as well. Um, and yeah, the, as I said, it uses the Kafka auto balancing mechanism. The KMQ client, which I uh, which we have. Uh, uh, which we went through, uh, is a single uh, Java class implementing these five steps, if you remember, uh, plus there's the value classes for the markers. And that's, every, and that's uh, in essence, everything in, in KMQ. So again, it's quite a simple, uh, code-wise, it's quite a simple project. So uh, to actually implement the individual uh, acknowledgments in Kafka, all you need is one Kafka application to handle the redeliveries, plus a bit smarter client to actually read messages from the Kafka cluster. Okay, so to summarize, uh, we have implemented individual selective message acknowledgments, which are quite similar in how they work to SQS with divisibility timeout. Uh, that's, uh, I think it's a valuable in alternative to the uh, up to an offset acknowledgments, which you get out of the box in Kafka, uh, especially if you integrate with external systems. As far as performance is uh, concerned, um, in terms of th th in terms of throughput, we get comparable numbers. The latency can be worse when the cluster is under stress, 
And of course, you also get a bit of a storage overhead because you need to have that additional metadata topic, right? However, the metadata topic, the markers topic, uh, can have a very short retention uh, policy. Uh, it only needs, in fact, to uh, keep the markers of uh, visibility timeout plus some buffer for the reader tracker to actually catch up. Uh, anything older than the visibility timeout can be safely discarded. Um, a couple of links. Uh, so the project is open source on GitHub if you'd like to, to take a look or uh, maybe use it. Uh, there's also an introductory blog where I explain more or less what I've said about here. We also have uh, a, perform, uh, a comparison of performance between various message queues. So uh, this benchmark focuses on the queues which can replicate the data. Um, so there you can see how uh, Rabbit, uh, ActiveMQ, Kafka, Mongo, and some others compare in terms of functionality and performance. Um, uh, there are some both uh, comparison in terms of latency and and uh, throughput. And yeah, if you had, if you would have any questions after the, this talk, uh, I'm available on Twitter, email, and here until Friday. So yeah, so I would be happy to answer any questions if you have some. Thank you. Yeah. Are you moving to JMS with this or something separate? Okay, uh, so the question is uh, am I moving to JMS? So I suppose you, if you wanted to, you could implement a JMS interface on top of, so like this, a JMS interface on top of SQS, for example. And I, I guess you could implement JMS on top of that, but I didn't do it yet at least. But it should be possible. I mean, the model is quite similar. Yeah? Sorry? When do you give up on a message? Okay, so currently the question is when do you give up on a message? That's a very good question. So currently uh, we never give up, give up on a message. So what you would need here is before re-delivering the message, you would need to apply some transformation on it to actually mark it as being re-delivered as, let's say, five or six times, right? To in increment a re-delivery counter. But that's, that, that's like very message specific. So uh, it's not implemented in any generic way you would have to apply the transformation before the message is re-delivered. Re so it's, it's quite easy to do, uh, but it's not there yet. Yeah? Yeah, so we, uh, we as a company are using this. Not in production yet, but getting close. Okay, thank you again. And sorry for the demo, it didn't work. I'll fix it in a couple of minutes.